how it's so exciting to see that children, you know, they really can hunger after the things of God and they really can hunger after God's word. And if we teach them how to be self feeders, you Mm -hmm. know, how much better off are they going to be than if they're just continually dependent on us for every spiritual meal? Hey everyone, this is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. I am so excited that you are with me this week because I have a guest on with me this week who is just going to bless your socks off. I absolutely know it because the topic that we are talking about today is by far the most important topic that we ever talk about on this podcast. We are talking about the Word of God and how to study the Bible with our kids and how to teach our kids how to study the Bible. And so we are here this week with my new friend, Elizabeth Urbanowitz, and I'm really, really excited to dig into this. But before we do, I want to thank our sponsor, CTC Math. If you guys are looking for a great online math program, go to ctcmath.com, check them out. You will love them. Your kids, I think, will really enjoy it and be encouraged by their curriculum and just the way that they have developed it. It's it's very helpful and fun for kids. So ctcmath.com. Elizabeth Urbanowitz, thank you for being with me today. I know you are one very, very busy lady, and so I am very honored that you've taken time out of your week to spend with me and to spend with our audience to uh, just talk with us about um, your ministry, Foundation Worldview, what the Lord is doing through that, and we're going to talk about studying scripture. So tell us about yourself and your ministry and what you're doing. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me on today, Yvette. It's just a joy to be here with you. And um, I'm sure most of your wa- your watchers and listeners are homeschool moms and dads who love their kids, you know, and just are seeking to invest in them. And I'm not married, so I don't have children of my own, but my background is in education. And I love working with children. I love getting to disciple the next generation. And I was working as a Christian educator in um, a Christian school, and I loved my job. And while I was there, I just noticed that even though my students parents were really intentional at discipleship, and I was giving them a biblically-based education all day long, they were still rapidly absorbing ideas from the culture and just lacking Mm. skills, you know, and really understanding how to read and interpret God's word and therefore apply it to their lives. And so I just started looking for resources that I could use in my own classroom that would just equip these kids to carefully evaluate every idea they encounter and hold it up to the truth of God's word. And when I couldn't find anything, I started creating my own resources resources and never intended to start a company that would do this, you know, just (laughs) wanted to keep teaching um, the little ones that God had placed in my care. But several years after doing this, you know, so many people started contacting me saying, Hey, how can we get our hands on your resources? And I was like, you can't, I'm a third grade teacher. I'm not a publishing house. Um, But eventually the Lord made it clear that he had other plans. And so now I run Foundation Worldview, which is a ministry that seeks to provide parents and educators and kids ministry leaders with just resources that they can use to equip kids to carefully evaluate every idea they encounter and hold Mm. it up against the lens of God's word. And so I'm really excited to be able to do that and just to see what the Lord is doing in and through those materials. Oh, it's so great. You know, we talk so often on the podcast about homeschooling and the privilege that we have to be with our Mm -hmm. kids and to disciple their hearts. And we talk about all sorts of things. We talk about organization, we talk about curriculum, and we talk about scheduling our day out. And we talk about so many things, but every time we always point it back to, but... God's word. It is the mm-hmm. most important thing. If your kids are a math whiz and they know everything there is about science or everything there is to know about history, but they don't know the word of God, mm-hmm. you're doing it wrong. I'm saying that out loud. You're doing it wrong. If your kids don't know Jesus and they don't have a relationship with him, mm-hmm. you're you're homeschooling them wrong. You need to point them to Jesus. That is our job as parents, because in the end, All that matters is their relationship with Christ. And, you know, many years ago, I realized that we could know everything about the Bible, but if we don't know Jesus personally, it makes absolutely no difference if we don't have a relationship with him. However, the way that we earn and gain a relationship with him is by knowing his word and learning how to dig deep into his word. And so oftentimes on this podcast, we have had different, you know, um, publishers and authors of different Bible curriculum. And we love that. We love having them on and we only ever bring people on who we, we believe in what they have published and written. But this is a little bit different what you're doing. You're not just teaching people like, here's what the Bible says. You're teaching kids and parents alike how to dig into scripture and how to really study and understand God's word. And so I love your, your testimony. I love how God 
just got you on this path of teaching this to people and first kids. So talk about you know, just that transformation that you saw really in your own class and how, I mean, are you still seeing those kids? I don't know how long ago you did that, but are you still talking to any of those kids? And have you seen in the long run that kids who you've taught how to study God's word mm -hmm. are still holding tight to that? Yeah, those are great questions. And so it's been five years now since I've been out of the classroom. So okay. my students are now, you know, in eighth grade on up. Some of them are out of college and married, uh, which wow. I can't even believe. <laughs> um, but yes, it's been exciting just to see how, you know, when kids are little, when you really equip them to study mm -hmm. scripture, how it can last, you know, their entire lives. Like even just this weekend, a former student texted me and, you know, my students still call me Miss You, even though I tell them they can call me Elizabeth. And she was like, <laughs> Miss You, you know, like Miss You, like I'm reading God's word and I love him, but how do I make Jesus the only thing I want? Wow. <laughs> you know, and just, I was just like, oh, and I texted her back. And I was like, let's talk, you know, this is a really great question. Let's talk on the phone. And then um, a few weeks ago, my brother, um, he went in to have a doctor's appointment and his doctor is actually the dad of a former student of mine. And when he went in for the appointment, the dad was like, Oh, make sure you tell your sister that my son is, a, you know, like he just graduated high school and he's about to have completed his third time reading through the Bible. Wow. And like, I was just like, Oh, that is so exciting. Cause you know, when I graduated high school, I hadn't read through the entirety yeah. of scripture. You know, right. it wasn't until I was in college and I was like, if I call myself a Christian and that means I'm a Christ follower, I better get reading, you know, right. this book that God in, has revealed himself to us. And so, yes, it is so exciting for me to see, you know, this transformation continue. And when I was teaching, I had this, I had this one aha moment that really has led me now to where I am in teaching kids how to read scripture and interpret it. And I was teaching a really engaging and interactive Bible lesson. You know, I'm sure so many homeschool parents, you know, like to do that, make the Bible come alive to your children. And I was doing this in the classroom and all of the students were engaged in this activity. And I just had this moment where I stood and I looked around the room and I thought, what are they going to do over the summer? Mm. And I thought, you know, if, if I'm not there to plan Bible lessons and if their parents aren't planning Bible lessons or reading devotionals with them every day, are they going to have any daily interaction with God's word? Mm -hmm. And I knew the answer to that question without a doubt. You know, I knew the answer was no, because I had been creating dependence on me, which is something, you know, that I even saw in the women's Bible studies that I was part of. I remember one year, you know, I was, I was part of a great women's Bible study. We had an amazing teacher, you know, she was just really solid in God's word. She wrote the studies herself, just, just amazing. But I remember in my small group, it was one of our last weeks and the women were like, oh my goodness, like it's May and Bible study doesn't start up again until September. Like, what are we going to do? And I was like, <laughs> read the Bible. Right. And everybody was like, how are, how do we do that? And I was like, oh my goodness, like, do we adults yeah. not even know how to do this without a Bible study leader writing questions for us right. or an author writing a devotional for us? And I thought, you know, this, this can't be like, yes, we can utilize teachers and other resources to help us. But we really, if, if we know how to read, we should know how to read God's word. And so that moment, you know, in my Bible study, and then that, you know, the, the corresponding moment in my classroom really got me thinking, what can I do to get these kids comfortable in reading God's word? And so the next day I came back to school and I completely changed my game plan. Now I, I put down the school's Bible curriculum. I didn't abandon it in that I still stayed on track with what we should have been learning throughout the school year. But instead of, you know, like planning these lessons with skits and, you know, games and all this, I was like, you know, what, we're just going to read the Bible. And so yeah. I had my students take out their Bibles and we would read, you know, the portion together. And I would just slowly give them skills in how to read and interpret scripture. And I mean, at the time we were reading through the book of Deuteronomy, you know, oh, so it's not even like we were like in the gospel of John right. or something, you know? Um, and then we did that together. And then, you know, um, the month, next month I would break them up into small groups and have them implement those skills. And then we'd come back together and talk about it. And then the month after that, I'd have them read on their own. And then we'd come back together and talk about it. And to my shock and amazement, most of the students really took off with it. Like they wow. felt all of a sudden empowered to be like, oh my goodness, like I can read this on my own. Now, granted, you know, there's certain passages in the old Testament, you know, at an eight or nine year old level that aren't developmentally sure. appropriate. So we would skip over those and we would talk about why, you know, it's, these are in God's word for a reason, but you know, they talk about, there's some portions that talk about human sin and you know what, at eight, and nine years old, you don't need right. to know about all of the human sin that's out there. Right. Um, but it was just so exciting for me to see. And so many students challenged themselves after that to continue reading through the Bible, you know, yeah. over the summer and the next years when I'd be in the cafeteria, having cafeteria duty, the students would. <laughs> 
would stop me and say, Oh, miss you. Like I'm, you know, I'm almost done with the old Testament. I'm in Jeremiah or miss you. I'm in the gospels or miss you. I'm almost done. I'm in revelation. And I was like, wow, it's so exciting to see that children, you know, they really can hunger after the things of God and they really can hunger after God's word. And if we teach them how to be self feeders, you Mm -hmm. know, how much better off are they going to be than if they're just continually dependent on us for every spiritual meal? So it's just so exciting to see what the Holy Spirit can do in the life of a child, you know, who's really equipped to seek God through his word. Yeah, that's incredible. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. What we do at IEW is break through the, the noise of the grammar and the writing prompts. And we say, this is what you do step by step. And I've witnessed it over and over again, both watching Andrew teach and hearing from parents, this is the best writing program. We've made it so easy and made it really affordable. So any mom can teach writing to their children using our course, and we guarantee it. To try three weeks of free lessons, visit IEW.com. We are back with Elizabeth, or would you say Miss You? <laughs> I'm assuming Miss You because your little ones, it was hard for them to say Urbanowitz. Is that right? Yes, that's such a long last name for eight year olds. <laughs> <laughs> Though you're talking about eight year olds who were learning to read the Word of God, which is that's absolutely true. incredible. So they probably could have said Urbanowitz. I mean, there are some pretty hard uh, words in the Bible that even I'm like, nah, I don't know how to say that one. That is true. <laughs> it can be a little bit confusing sometimes. We, we in our family, if there's a word or a name of somebody, it's usually a name of somebody who we just have no idea how to pronounce it. We'll just make up some funny pronunciation <laughs> and, <laughs> and move on. Love it. Um, but I do find it absolutely incredible that you were teaching this to third graders because as you're talking, it seems like, oh, this is something you could teach to a high school or you can teach them how to study scripture and they can go off and do it. But you were doing this with little kids. This is third graders and man, what, there's no better foundation for these kids Mm -hmm. because those, those little years, those are the foundation years. That's where their foundation is being set. And Mm -hmm. so for, in those years, them to learn how to study God's word and to get excited about reading through the Bible is absolutely incredible. And so, um, you know, you talked about teaching children to think well. Um, What do you mean by that? Why why is it important? And we we actually just recently did an episode with Kathy Gibbons on logic. Mm -hmm. And so I know this kind of goes along Mm -hmm. with the topic of logic. Um, But what do you mean by it when you say teaching kids to think well? Usually the the terminology I love to use is teaching kids to think carefully Mm. because, you know, all throughout scripture, we're commanded, you know, to use our minds to honor God, you know, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ, you know, to not be taken captive by the hollow and deceptive philosophies of our world. So scripture is clear that the life of the mind is important. You know, it's not the only portion of the Christian life, but you can't have a Christian life that honors the Lord with out involving the life of the mind. And we know, you know, that God, I mean, praise God, he is unchanging. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know that God's word is unchanging. You know, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. And so you know, we serve an unchanging God with an unchanging word, but what is changing is the culture around us. And so if we want to raise up faithful disciples of Jesus in this cultural moment, we have to understand the cultural context in which our kids are going to be faced, you know, not only as children, but as teens and as adults. Um, and so one thing that makes this cultural moment really unique is the vast quantities of information that our children are presented with. You know, even if we're careful about limiting screen time, even if we're very careful about what's allowed in our home and what's not, you know, our children are exposed to so much, you know, we can't even go and pump gas anymore without a screen coming and, you know, presenting who knows what. And so, you know, on average, you know, even if we're really careful about what our kids are exposed to on average, our children are going to be presented with more competing ideas in one year of their life than most humans throughout history, throughout their entire lives than they've been presented with. And so we're cramming into one year, you know, what most humans haven't even had to deal with throughout their entire lives. So we need to teach our children to carefully sift through information. And this involves a lot of things, you know, obviously it involves them knowing scripture and knowing what scripture says, because if they don't know it, they're not going to have any standard by which, you know, against which to hold an idea. We also need to equip them to actually just slow down and think through, okay, 
what was I just presented with? You know, like what was the message that mm-hmm. I just heard, whether that was from a friend, from a family member, from a YouTube video, from a textbook, you know, what is this idea that I've just been presented with so that they know how to carefully think through what they just heard and then mm-hmm. think through, okay, how do I know whether or not this is true, you know, so that they're holding it up against God's word. And they're also thinking logically about it, you know, and so this involves several different things. You know, if somebody says to them, you know, like, oh, well, it's wrong to judge. Even the Bible says it's wrong to judge. (laughs) Well, two things right there. One, they need to have the skill to think through, okay, that person just made a judgment about judging, right? (laughs) They made the judgment that said that judging is wrong. So that statement can't be correct because it just broke its own rule. You know, in order to say that it's incorrect to judge, you have to make a judgment. So that doesn't stand up. But then that person also just said, you know, that's what God's word has to, that's what God's word says. So our kids need to know, okay, let me go and look, first of all, does God's word actually say that? And then if somebody has just quoted a verse, what does that verse say? in context. Right. Because when we read that verse, you know, where when Jesus says, you know, judge not lest ye be judged, you know, and we read further, it talks about, you know, first getting the log out of our own eye and then getting the speck out of our brother. So it's not just saying, oh, you know what, just say it's a free for all, you know, who am I to judge? It's like, no, we have to examine our own lives yeah. and our own hearts and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what sin we have there. So then out of love, we can go and help somebody else get the speck out of their own eye. So that, that's what I mean when when I say teaching kids to think carefully, to pause, to evaluate what is this idea that has just been present, I've just been presented with, does this idea logically make sense? And then Mm -hmm. if someone is quoting scripture, is that verse, has that verse been pulled out of context or is it being used in the manner in which God had the original author write it? So just such important skills to teach our children. (laughs) Yeah. I so appreciate that you talk about that because you can pull any topic of sin. Mm -hmm. And you can back it up with scripture that's taken out of context. Mm -hmm. You can back up abortion. You can back up homosexuality. Mm -hmm. You can back up infidelity. You can back up just about anything by taking a part of scripture completely out of context. And that's exactly what's happening in our world today. And unfortunately, there are a lot of pastors who are doing that from the pulpit. And it's really scary. I think it's why the church is in such trouble right now. Because people are saying, you know, their pastor is saying, you know, they're literally opening opening up the Bible and they're saying, look, the Bible says, you know, that you're your own God. The Bible says this, the Bible says that. Mm-hmm. And the people are going, oh yeah, I see it right there. So it must be true. And no, no, they're not looking at scripture as a whole, but because they haven't been taught how to study scripture and they don't know how to exposit it whatsoever. And so sadly, so many people are being misled by these people who are supposed to be shepherding them according to God's word. And so I I so appreciate what you're doing with your ministry and this curriculum that you have developed to help us as as parents to teach our kids how to dig into God's word. I want to ask one question really quickly. Um, As you're teaching your kids to think well, do you think it's important to teach our kids Um, about other worldviews, because we want to teach them everything, of course, from a Christian biblical worldview. But do you also teach kids from a secular worldview at the same time? That's a question that I love, because I think that question, you know, thinking through, should we expose our kids to other worldviews? That's something that can seem very, very scary. Um, Mm -hmm. I think especially for those who are homeschooling, because most homeschooling parents are so intentional, you know, at discipleship. And I love that. And I can think like, We can think like, oh, like this is our home. Like we don't want any alternate ideas there. And it's like, well, you know, we're all sinful. So we all bring alternate ideas into our house, you know, every day. And we need to be prepared to recognize them. And so what I really encourage parents to do in this situation, and when we think about When we think about protecting our kids, protection does not equal complete isolation, but it equals preparation, Mm -hmm. appropriate preparation. And the example I like to give is actually from my first few years of teaching, you know, um, I'm sure there's a ton of homeschooling moms watching right now who were teachers, you know, before they had children. You know that your first year, (laughs) yes, you know, your first year of teaching, you get sick a ton because you know, like everybody's breathing in your face, you know, you're just exposed to all these germs. And then your second year, you're supposed to get sick a little bit less. And like third year is supposed to be the charm, you know, you're, you're immune to everything. Well, 
for me, the exact opposite happened. You know, I got sick a good deal my first year and I got sick even more my second year. And then my third year before Christmas, I was on my eighth round of antibiotics and I was like, okay, something needs to change. So I went to the doctor and I was like, okay, I'm not here like for more sinus infection medicine. Like I want to talk about like, what is the root of this? Because I should not be getting this many sinus infections, you know, the first um, half of the school year. And so right. the doctor just sat down with me. He asked me a whole bunch of questions. And one of the questions he asked me was how often I was washing my hands. And I happen to be a germaphobe. So I like, mm-hmm. like wash my hands all the time. And I happened to be teaching in a mobile classroom that didn't have a sink. So I was using hand sanitizer probably like 50 plus times a day. And the doctor oh, wow. was like, okay, <sighs> ding, 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 ding. I think we found our problem. <laughs> and he said, you know, what, he's like, you know, using hand sanitizer is good before you're about to eat something or before you're about to rub your eyes, your nose or your mouth. He said, Mm -hmm. but just throughout the day, he said, if you're constantly using hand sanitizer, what you're doing is you're not only killing the germs that you've picked up from your classroom, but you're also killing all of the good bacteria Mm -hmm. and you're not giving your body an opportunity to get immunity in small doses to these germs. So he said, I'd like you to try washing your hands instead of using hand sanitizer. And he said, and just do that before you eat or before you need to, to rub your eyes, nose, or mouth. <laughs> and the amazing thing that happened is once I took that advice, I didn't get another sinus infection for five years. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it was like incredible because my body had the opportunity to get exposed to these germs in small mm-hmm. doses and build up immunity. And the same thing is true with our kids. You know, if we never, you know, allow them to see any movie, you know, that that doesn't Mm -hmm. have a Christian theme, or if we never allow them to read any secular book, or we never allow them, you know, to, to see any possible YouTube video or play with the neighborhood kids who are maybe not believers. Yes. Any exposure, you know, to things that are, you know, to either unbelievers or unbelieving content, Mm -hmm. then they're going to have this false dichotomy that like anything that's Christian is safe and anything that's not Christian is bad. Where, as you just mentioned, there are so many non like things that are considered within the Christian community that aren't biblical. And then, you know, by God's common grace, you know, we have engineers and scientists who are not Christians who, you know, like they are able to say true things because they're made in God's image, you know, so we want to equip our kids to filter through, okay, what is true? What is not? So what I recommend to parents is that we expose our kids to the ideas of competing worldviews in small, safe, healthy doses and help them understand how those ideas do not line up with reality. Like in my own classroom, I would teach my students a topic like, you know, we'd look at the topic of right and wrong, for example, and say, okay, what does the Bible teach about this? And we wouldn't look at like rules specifically, but we'd look at like, where do right and wrong come from? Are right and wrong real things or do humans just invent them? And we'd see, oh, look at like right and wrong are real. You know, they're not made up and they stem from God's character that right is anything that goes along with God's character and wrong is anything that goes against it. And we find the specific rules for this in scripture. And then we'd look at what other worldviews taught. And then we'd look at like movie clips or just short TV clips and identify what worldview is present. And it was so exciting for me to see that the kids that God had placed in my care were so easily able to pick up Mm -hmm. on ideas that not only contradicted God's word, they contradicted reality. Like when I just taught, you know, the, like the new age belief, you know, that we're supposed to follow our hearts, you know, and that's how we determine right from wrong. One of my students raised his hand. He said, uh, miss you, I'm super confused. And I said, Josh, what are you confused about? He said, okay, so what if my heart tells me I need a new video game and my dad's heart tells him that I don't need a new video game. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting question. So are you saying like our hearts are going to guide us in different ways. And he was like, yeah, all the time. I was like, okay. So in that situation, who would win? Like who would be the right one? He was like, well, my dad, cause he's the biggest and the strongest and he's the one that has the money. <laughs> and I said, oh, so you mean if we just follow our hearts, our hearts are going to con- conflict. And then whoever is the biggest and the strongest and has the most money, they're the ones that gets to win. <laughs> and so it's just exciting to see, you know, when we slowly expose our kids to these ideas, yeah. then they're able to see they don't align with reality. And then, you know, I showed my students a clip I can't remember if it was from Aladdin or it was from Pocahontas, but we, I showed them some Disney movie clip and then they were like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, that's just following your heart and that's going to lead to all sorts of trouble. Uh, <laughs> and so it's so exciting. So when we can expose them while they're still within the safety of our own yeah. homes, we're preparing them, you know, really like inoculating them, you know, against these viruses, these alternate yeah. worldviews that are out there. Yeah. So Great. We are out of time, but we are going to come back on Wednesday. We're going to continue talking about digging into scripture, learning God's word, teaching our kids 
how to study God's word so that they will hold tight to it forever. Because again, it is the most important thing. Um, Elizabeth, where can people find out more about you and your curriculum? We'll talk a little bit more about that later in the week. Uh, but where can people find out more about you? Yeah, go to foundationworldview.com. If you go to foundationworldview.com, you can find all of our resources there. Sounds great. We'll have those links in the show notes. Of course, if you guys have not left a review for the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast, please do that. Just take a minute, pause what you're doing, pause this uh, podcast and just leave a review really quickly. It's easy to do. Thank you so much for those of you who have done that already. It is such a blessing to be able to just read through your comments and how the Lord has blessed you through the Schoolhouse Rocked ministry. Um, And it helps others to know why the Schoolhouse Rock podcast is worth listening to. So thank you for being with us. We'll be back with Elizabeth on Wednesday. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you back then. Bye. Education is discipleship. And this is something I didn't understand until I was probably three years into homeschooling. The Bible teaches us in Luke 640 that when a student is fully trained, he will be like his teacher. And as we look around the culture right now, Uh, I think it begs the question, who is teaching our children? Who is teaching our children and what are they teaching our children? And to me, the benefit, the primary benefit of having my children home with me is I am able to impart my worldview to my children. 